interactive live show that focuses on the communities, the people, and the events in Craven County. Now welcome today's host, Steve Tyson. Good morning and welcome to All About Craven, CTV 10's All About Craven. This is Monday morning with Steve Tyson and surprise, I wonder if you're just as surprised as I was, but Steve unfortunately is not here yet. He's, uh, he's going to have something to talk about when he gets here, I'm sure, but he is stuck in some traffic on his way here. Fortunately, I came from a different direction, so whatever this, uh, this magic that they're performing on Highway 70 right now wasn't affecting me, so you get to enjoy a few minutes with me this morning as we wait for Steve to arrive. So I came on this morning to talk about some of the work that we've been doing with a few organizations that are based locally. One of them is Realize You. Uh, Realize You is an addiction recovery home that we're bringing to, it's a home and treatment center that we're bringing to Craven County to serve the residents of Craven County and of New Bern. Uh, we had a big fundraiser this last weekend. Uh, there's a link to our website if you wanna go and check out some more information about our mission statement. But our mission is to help provide, um, help people, empower people who struggle with substance use disorder, with addictions in their past to overcome those challenges that they faced, overcome some of the negative consequences of their former life and the behaviors that have held them down from realizing their true potential. Uh, so our program is designed to work with individuals for uh, up to two years in a multi-phase program to help them really get back to where they want to be, help empower them with the tools and the knowledge and the understanding to really live the life that they want, be, uh, make a contribution to society, to live into their potential, to experience some of the success and the happiness that they're certainly capable of if they had the right tools, the right empowerment. So we're extremely excited about this program. Uh, there's, there's nothing else, um, there's, there's few other programs like it, and there's certainly not enough programs like doing this kind of work that are serving our community, so we're extremely excited about that. Um, uh-oh, I hear some noise in the background. Let's see who, let's see who's going to, uh, show up this morning, and, and with this beautiful shirt on, there's got to be a story behind this shirt also. Uh, all right, Steve, well, uh, from yeah, the top. There is definitely a story behind this shirt and um so we'll talk more about that in a moment and uh let's see what shirt, steve's been okay. up to it is kind of a cool shirt yeah. i had on a purple shirt and i had on brown shoes and i had on gray pants i was getting ready to walk out the door and my wife said stop the boat here we need to we need to rethink this <laughs> so, she uh, she actually dressed me. Then I got in my car and I called Bob and I thought I might be running just a little bit late anyhow, but then I hit the traffic on the bridge where they've closed it to one lane. Sure. So, and that's progress. I understand that. I started to get anxious and get ill, but then I said, nah, cut on some music. I said, Garrett's got this. So anyhow, don't know what you've talked about before I got here, but I'm sure you're kind of prepping the audience absolutely so. okay so, yeah, so. Just, so just introduce a little bit about our program realize you and uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about this morning is a fundraising event that we had and some fundraising that we're still doing over the next uh, four to six weeks so that we can finally get this program up and running it's something that uh, there's eight local board members eight eight residents in New Bern that have been working for this or on this program for about two years now uh, it's just a very long and arduous process to get one of these programs up and running, but we're yeah, that doesn't we, we happen overnight. Light, that's does right. It? We can see light at the end of the tunnel. We just got a couple more things that we need to do, so we're doing one last fundraising drive to get the money that we need to finish this house and get everything in order, get furniture in the house. We already have people that are lined up, ready to come in. Our executive director has been doing some screening of people that are applying. We have between uh, there's about eight people that are ready to come in as soon as we get a bed available for them. They've been struggling with opioid addiction. They've been struggling with uh, many issues in their past. They're, they're at that place where they're ready. They, they need a program like this to help them, help them get back on their feet. Absolutely, and we're gonna talk about this program in detail. I don't think a lot of people are even aware that this has been going on. Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly it's been in the, in the news a little bit, but uh, it's our intention to make this the public very aware of this program here. Yes. Okay. I hope everybody have a had a really good weekend. I did. It was very hot, but I'm just a hot weather guy. I'd rather it be a hundred. I'm serious when I say this, and I would. Then I then I'd rather see it like forty or something like that. It just makes me feel better. It loosens up my 
bones in my yeah. arthritis and I just feel much better. But for those of you that don't like that 97 to 100 degree weather, you're going to get a little bit relief, it looks like to me, tomorrow. It looks like it's going to be in the 80s for four or five days. Wow. So that's going to feel like probably being in the 60s. Sure. We'll see people wearing jackets around town. All right. We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back, and we're going to talk about a wonderful program. All right, we're back live with Garrett Biss, and we're talking about a new program in Newbern. And Garrett, thanks for coming on. And thanks for having me. Who initiated this endeavor? It's a great question. I know Lee Bettis has been involved since since the beginning, and uh, he's really passionate about it. during one of his during his last campaign season. He really going out and meeting people. He realized how severe of an issue it was affecting the whole community. Of course, he deals with people on a day to day basis that are struggling with addiction or substance use disorder. Uh, so he sees it firsthand, but when he really got out in the community, he realized how widespread it was. It wasn't just his clients, but he got to a point where he's tired of his clients dying while they're waiting for trial because they keep overdosing. They hear they're not getting the help that they need, and he said, you know, we got to put an end to it. So that really inspired him to uh, bring some people together and, and try to find a solution. To start any program, a lot of people generally, when it's a good program, uh, are out in the community and you're thinking this would be, Newber needs this, mm -hmm. or... Craven County needs this, uh, but it takes somebody to initiate to get the ball rolling, and I guess would that have been Lee Bettis? Uh, I think so, I, I and then when he kind of sat down with a steering committee and, and asked some asked Kim some Brill was professional. Yeah, involved Kim Brill, Catherine Beavers from the uh, Coastal uh, Pain Management Clinic here uh, on News Boulevard, Kim Brill from LCA Advertising, and then Dick Betts, who's been uh, a therapist, psychologist for a number of years, worked with that, uh, people struggling with substance use disorder for more than 30 years. Uh, Ruth Cox, um, Steve Strickland, bringing his financial mind to, uh, uh, and his nonprofit mind to, to the table. We have a gentleman named Pastor Charles, who's been providing some, some guidance. Uh, and myself, and I think that was eight names. I believe I named off. So eight. I mean, you've got good resources. All Absolutely. those folks you mentioned are, yeah. are, you know, quality people. They've done a lot in the community before. They know how to get things done. There's always one missing ingredient, and that is the dollar sign. That's right. It takes dollars to put any kind of program together. And we'll talk about that that later. Um, so you started this. A several years ago. That's right. Realize to you. Realize you 252. So the name uh, that we came up with, Realize You, is for two reasons. Our primary mission is to help individuals realize their real potential, realize their true potential, realize uh, how to have a good positive life after struggling with addiction. And so that's our primary mission. It'll always be our focus of working with individuals in our program. But also our, our other mission is helping the community realize how big of an issue it is. Helping, I mean, everybody in our community is affected. If you know somebody or you don't know somebody, uh, it's, it's either you, it's a loved one, it's a neighbor, it's somebody in your community, somebody that you see out in, out in town that you may not realize is struggling or has been struggling. But everybody has, has been affected. I mean, about I one mean, in eight to one in ten. Affects the yeah. wealthiest people right down right. to the poorest people. That's right. Yeah, it's something that yeah, it does not discriminate. It touches everybody and affects everybody. Okay. So the program began two years ago, and it, at what point in time did you start seeing it gather some momentum? Because you've been involved pretty much from the beginning. That's right? right. So, yeah, there's a lot of good momentum in the beginning, uh, a lot of things coming together, some ideas. We were running around looking at different properties, trying to get a real good, clear um, idea of what the program was going to look like. Last fall, we found a property that was ideal for housing uh, the, the individuals that we're working with, the clients that we're working with, so we signed a lease on that. Um, and, then, and then we just kind of hit a, a stagnant point as we waited for our 501c3 status to be approved from the IRS. And, uh, that's quite How a long, long process. Did, really? I've yeah, they say, you know, they say anywhere between, a, you know, a, a, a couple of months, you know, six months uh, or, or more. It took us about a year, a little bit more than a year to hear back from them. So then when we heard back from them, now it's, you know, we're, we're gaining that momentum again. But we're doing one final push. We, a, a big uh, missing ingredient that we had or a key piece that we needed was an executive director and a clinical director. And fortunately, we found uh, the perfect individual who's familiar with Eastern North Carolina. Um, he's worked in the addiction field. He's run two homes just like this, or he stood up two homes just like this, worked at one for the last six years. Uh, so he came on board, and now now we just need some furniture. We need a little bit of 
uh, work done at the house to finish it up. And what kind of furniture do you need? Uh, we've, uh, we just need to ha um, bed the whole or ha house the whole thing. So we're going to have 12 patients living in the house, and so we this, need 12 single. This might be your lucky day yeah? because I happen to have quite a bit of furniture that I need to get rid of. Is that right? <laughs> All right. So, great. We'll, we'll certainly yeah. chat about that. Uh, and now we, so we had a wonderful donor donate enough flooring, so the new um, LVT flooring for the whole house, about 3,000 square feet. So now we've got some volunteers working on that, putting that down. That's a, that's a, that's a long process, but once we get that done and we get some quarter round around, touch up a little bit of the paint, and then do a good cleaning of it and put some furniture in there, we're ready to go. And like I said, we have eight, eight patients ready to come in, like ready to start today if we could accept them. But. You've done a lot of research on this issue of uh, opiate addiction, drug mm -hmm. addiction. Uh, what, I mean, Give me some of your aha moments of, of what you discovered. Yeah, sure. Well, for, um, one thing that really just inspires my passion about this is recognizing that I don't, I mean, the people that struggle with addiction, so let me back up. So I think addiction is a, it's a maladaptive coping mechanism, and it's something that all humans struggle with in some form or fashion. Unfortunately, for some people, their addictions manifest as like an opioid addiction or severe alcoholism or an addiction to gambling or sex or online uh, you know, many ways that, that we think of more traditionally as these addictions because of the consequences that they have. But every human being, addiction is just a way to cope with or deal with some kind of uncomfort in, uh, in us or some kind of pain like in us. smoking. That's right. Yeah, so smoking could be one. On. But then other people, I mean, there's, there's, there's noble addictions like workaholism. I mean, many people, they, they My continue wife to... My accuses me of that all the time, and I think there's yeah. something to be said about that. Certainly. Yeah. And, you know, and it's... And, it can always come from a good. It can come from a good place. There's some that you know. There's some things like that. Can, it can if it's a severe passion or something that we're really involved in. It can come. It, it brings a lot of good into our life, and it can come from a good place. So long as we're not using it to escape something, or so long as we're not using it to ignore or avoid something that's going wrong in our life, uh, then a lot of positive can come from that. But I think every human being, we find some way to escape or avoid or numb. For some people, they have a sweet tooth. For some people, they like to do some shopping, and maybe they have enough income, and it's not something that that. Um, that really unravels their life, but for some unfortunate few, either their coping mechanisms weren't good enough when they face the challenges, their struggles, or the traumas in their life to cope with them in a more natural way or in a less destructive way, or the amount of pain or trauma that they experienced was so severe that nothing else could help alleviate that pain or that discomfort that they that they experienced. So when I re when I realized that that it's not it's not an addict issue, a non addict issue. I mean, we're all human beings we're all dealing with uh, this journey of life in a similar way and whether somebody is a severe addict or an opioid addict or not it's not a difference of kind it's not a difference of type of person it's just a difference of degree to which they're using something external to avoid so like, or escape i know a lot of people used to think that drug addicts were weak-minded mm -hmm. they didn't have any discipline they were just far humans yes, sir. Uh, and your research suggests otherwise it's just the way that they cope with their problems, right? That's right. I mean, we all, all have our that's right. issues, just like you said. And it's all about where they are in their life. So I believe that addiction is, is correlated to how much of potential we're living into. So I, I refer to it as realized potential. You know, we all have unlimited amounts of potential to actually succeed or be, um, uh, be happy, be fulfilled, make a contribution. But when we face challenges in our life and it affects our self-esteem or our self-efficacy, it affects the tools and the resource and our coping mechanism, the ability to show up because of the struggles that we face, that affects how much of our true potential we express or we live into. And when that gets low enough because of the challenges that you face, because of the pains, because of the hurt, or because of the environment that you grew up in, you just didn't develop the strong enough coping mechanisms, it gets you down to a place where you seek external stimuli to avoid or escape or numb the pain uh, that, you're, that you're in. A, a lot of the people I work with, the biggest pain that they have is they don't have enough meaning and purpose in their life. So they use substances or behaviors or anything that's detracting from their life to just avoid and escape that fact. I mean, there was a period in my life where I just didn't have any meaning. I didn't know what I, you know, I, I knew I wanted to do something. I knew what I wanted to make a contribution, but I didn't feel like I was doing it. And that left a tremendous void inside of me. And I had a, you know, a long, a long chapter in my life where I was running off and drinking as much as I could any chance I got because for a big part of it, trying to fill that void that I felt. So when, so that could be one reason that somebody has that tremendous amount of pain. It's not always because you come from a traumatic background or, you know, we think PTSD and we correlate that with, with addiction. 
Okay, that, that, that's certainly one cause of it, but there's a lot of other reasons. Some people just aren't given the, given the idea, given the roadmap, given the counseling or whatever to help them live into their potential and find something that's really meaningful. So, so many different sources of pain and many different ways to uh, escape that, and unfortunately, some have many more drastic consequences. But back to your point about being weak-minded, I mean, if you think that somebody is, you know, that another thing that really drew me into this is just the hypocrisy around addiction. So many people will judge or shame somebody who is an alcoholic or an opioid addict and completely ignore the fact that they're $50,000 in credit card debt or they're, you know, 110 pounds overweight. And it's like, you know, you have behaviors that are affecting We you. all have our problems. That's right. And if you're going to say that somebody is weak-minded because they can't put down some opioids or crystal meth or alcohol long enough to you know, to move beyond that, well, I mean, look at yourself. Let's, let's kind of come with an understanding and with judge compassion. Judge not, lest ye be judged. That's right, exactly. Right. So, the Bible says that, and it's absolutely true. Yeah, let's look at our own selves and, then, and, <clears throat> and, and use that to fuel compassion and understanding for somebody else because it's only through compassion. Uh, uh, one of the biggest reasons for addiction, one of the biggest uh, factors that fuels addiction is lack of connection, lack of having meaningful bonds, nurturing bonds with people. Uh, we feel, you know, we're in a society where we're more connected to other people but less you know, less socially, you know, less, uh, the connections that we have are much less nurturing because they're through Facebook or through email. Um, but those nurturing connections that we need to feel loved and accepted, that's what, that's what helps people avoid that temptation or avoid those, those behaviors. So when somebody is judged, when an addict or somebody that's struggling is judged, that only severs that connection even more. It only takes away more of what they need to nurture themselves to back to a healthy place. So that's why I always suggest look at our faults, look at our, the ways that we are doing things and, and use that to fuel compassion or understanding. Hold that thought. We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. Stick around. We've got a really good program for you today. All right, we're back and we're talking to Garrett Biss about a program that's getting ready to get started up in Newburgh, North Carolina to help with drug addiction. Um, oftentimes when people have a loved one that's facing this challenge, they don't know what to do. That's right. There are some pretty good resources now available. I know HOPE, and I can't remember what that acronym stands for. You probably do, but they... I just saw, yeah, we just saw it, uh... An ad on the... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they've been advertised. Uh, Opioid but, Prevention Education. I think it's HOPE. Heroin. Or heroin. Hope, yeah, or help. It's either HELP or HOPE, and then Opioid Prevention Education. But yeah, fantastic organization founded by people who've had family members that have struggled and that, a few that have lost family members that certainly understand what that's like, but they're to help, you know, help provide those resources. And, and, and Craven education. County joined a, na a, a national, I guess, uh, class action lawsuit against some of the manufacturers. And I know people, it's not the people that make it that cause the problem. Well, that's not exactly true. They went above and beyond what opiates should have been used for and actually encouraged people to, to use them in cases yeah. where they shouldn't have been used. And, and we looked at some evidence uh, before we joined that class action lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's, it's and you it's, know, they, it, they have culpability that, yeah, in this One of those things issue. that kind of snowballs out of control, you know, and everybody thinks, oh, you know, maybe they're not doing something that's positive, but it's but for their individual piece, it's only gonna, it's a little bit of a negative effect, so. But so, when so many things work together and snowball together, yeah, there, there are some, I don't, you know, when you look at some of the research, when you look at reasons that they were suggesting that these things weren't addictive, you couldn't, you know, you could force yourself to come to that conclusion in certain environments and certain situations. If somebody is living a very productive life, they're, they're healthy, they have everything going for them, their chance of becoming addicted to even the most addictive substances is relatively low, actually. Uh, so when you look at a population that has everything going for them, they have a support, they have good relationships, they don't have a traumatic background, their chance of becoming addicted is low. And if you, you, know, if you look at that small piece of the pie, then yeah, of course you can come to the conclusion that the chance of becoming addicted is low. Uh, this, Depends on what study you look at. I've read that only one in nine people, or two in, or sorry, one in ten, or two in ten, people that have been exposed to long-term opioid use actually become addicted for the long term. So that's a large majority of people that don't become addicted or, or chemically de chemically dependent once they go through a, a, a titration or a withdrawal process. Did, did the medical profession kind of change the way that they looked at pain? I mean, when I was young, I mean, even going back 20 years ago, and I wasn't young, but I was younger, uh, there wasn't, that I can remember, any 
so-called pain clinics. Sure. And and all and of a sudden, over a period of, yeah, that's a major of 10 piece. years, there was uh, quite a few of them. And I know that they, <laughs> I know this because I had a friend that used to go there sure. um, uh, to get pills. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, they were quite easy to get. And frankly, he probably abused them. Right. He had a back issue and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, And that's what, and you look at, you know, injuries on the job, and a lot of people, they're saying that, <clears throat> you know, they're, the, the prescription opioid was kind of like their gateway drug into things that either illegally obtained prescription opioids later or uh, or some people that transition to heroin because they can't get the pills that they need and the heroin's much cheaper. But you look at people that are introduced to these very, you know, these very powerful pain medications and back to the point of like meaning and purpose. When you take somebody that's been injured on the job or been in a car accident, now they're, their whole life has changed at that point. And if they're, they're taking pills, uh, maybe they're not working anymore, so their sense of meaning is gone. Maybe they're not able to get out and socialize anymore. They're not as involved in their family, so now their their natural connections are are uh, are going away. Those those bonding, loving connections are going away. Their ability to do things, the, the just that sense of meaning and purpose from being able to do something. So now you got this back injury, and now you're confined and or, or not as mobile as you used to be. You can't do the hobbies that you used to want to do. And you look at that, and I mean, it's a combination. It's the worst. So it's, it's a holistic time. approach that you have to take. That's right? right. As you mentioned, you have to give people purpose of life. And, and that's and that's what our program is really geared towards. It's not just, you know, it's not getting somebody through a detox. And that's not what we're focusing on. We're going to pick people up after they've been um, chemically detoxed and they're not physically dependent on a substance to help them deal with, put their life back together, help deal with and identify the behaviors, help deal with some of the lingering sources or the lingering trauma that they've had or the lingering pain and figure out why they're in the p place that they are, why they don't have the connection, the meaning, the purpose that they need. Um, just the, you know, the positive mindset or the, the natural emotional resilience to bounce back from challenges or struggles. And, it, and we're taking a holistic approach. So the multi-phase program, the first phase is dealing with a lot of individual therapy, a lot of helping somebody identify uh, the troubles that they faced in the past, why they started to devalue themselves or why they started to seek uh, the, 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 the behaviors and the chemicals that they have. And that, and that, so that's another thing. So we're certainly focusing on people that have struggled with opioid addiction, but really it's an, any addiction. So we're going to serve people that, whether they're alcoholics, uh, opioid addicts, crystal meth, whatever their drug of choice has been, it could be a behavioral addiction. Could what be are gambling, the similarities be... between opiate addiction and, and alcohol addiction? Yeah, so they work on the brains in, in different ways, but the similarities are it's an effective way of escaping the moment. It's an effective way of escaping your troubles. It calms you. Uh, you get a huge, uh, you get a great increase of dopamine in your brain. Dopamine is a natural um, hormone that reduces our stress hormones, our stress chemicals. So when you're, uh, you know, when you're constantly in a in a stressed state or in a panic state or you're triggered because of something that reminds you of the past or just something of your current situation that you know that you know that pain mm -hmm. like when I was struggling with that period of my life where I lacked a sense of meaning and purpose I constantly had to live in that it was a constant pain that I had to live in until I found a way to escape from it so either I would escape by distracting my mind and and working on a project or I would escape by drinking something or going somewhere or doing you know there's many things many behaviors that we can do to escape and so that's the similarity it's a mechanism for escaping now some people are more prone to one or more prone to another depends on what they've been introduced to other body inter interacts with it um, many people become addicted to alcohol because they find it as a coping mechanism very it's socially legal, acceptable it's easy to yes. get you know nobody looks at you, you know, weirdly so one, one thing I want to do to help with this education, helping raising the awareness, is how much we glamorize alcohol. I mean, anywhere you go into a store, you see little trinkets that says, like, hey, is it wine 30 yet? Or I don't drink alone, I drink with my cat. There's all these ways that we try to, you know, glamorize drinking. And, and Well, the government, I, I'm not sure if promoting it would be the right way, but the government certainly licenses it. it they yeah, prop sure. in North Carolina. Well, there's they one way to legalize it, it, but then we, we socially promote it by, you know, by glamorizing, by talking about it, especially in you know certain industries i mean in my past it was you, know, you didn't show up somewhere unless you brought alcohol with you it was just kind of ex ex uh, expected so and and back to that hypocrisy or back to looking at our own behaviors and comparing them to another instead of judging another person what you know what what would you think if you saw a little napkin or a bumper sticker that said you know is it time for my next you know my next oxycotton yet is it you know i, I don't struggle uh, alone i struggle with oxycotton and my you know my, my yeah, cat or, absolutely yeah, so. and and, and the reality is I think alcohol is probably a larger destructive force in the country than opiates. 
Sure. And, yeah, we have to look at the numbers as a whole. And, and a lot. I think probably a lot of the negative effects of alcohol are just never recognized because, again, they're so socially acceptable. You know, the troubles that people have at work or the, the troubles that they have. Marriages. In, yeah, in marriages and relationships. Financial. Uh, of, of all kinds, absolutely. Um, it doesn't get over to that, you know, tipping point or it's just but excused away. You, you mentioned that you would take in out. Uh, People yeah. that struggle with alcohol, but that's not your your primary focus. Well, right no, now, addiction, right? addiction, and addic addictive behaviors is our primary focus. Now, however, that manifests it, in somebody's life. Is there um, a program like the twelve step program for that they use at AA? Um, for is there something like addiction? that with opioids? Yeah, sure. There's, there's NA, Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> and do they have a, is it a 12-step program? It's a program, very similar. Same, runs very parallel same. to Alcoholics Anonymous. Really, the, only, the, the biggest difference is just the context of the conversations. You know, for, for people that have struggled with alcohol in their past, it shows up similarly in their life because it's always socially acceptable. You know, where the people that struggle with opioids, you don't go to a friend's house to watch a football game and everybody's passing opioids around. So it's a, it's a different experience. It manifests in different ways, different challenges, different struggles uh, than, than with alcoholism, but, ve but very similarly run parallel programs to following a 12-step model to uh, recognizing the issues, working through your own challenges and... and have you to have you place. studied the history of opiates in this in the in this country? I mean, yeah, her, heroin has been know. around for a long, That's long right. time. It's extremely fascinating book called Chasing the Screen by Johann Hari. Uh, he had a TED talk called uh, Everything That We Know About Addiction Is Wrong, or Almost Everything We Know About Addiction Is Wrong. And it's an extremely uh, extremely fascinating TED talk. And in there, he says the opposite of addiction is not sobriety; it's connection. And he goes through and he, he really shows all the ways that we lack connection to something, whether it's meaningful, whether it's relationships, whether it's a good sense of values, whether it's a good understanding, uh, um, uh, a, a healthy way of processing a, a troubled past, but all the different ways that we can find connection and therefore overcome addiction. But Chasing the Scream, it does a really good, he, he's a journalist, so he does a really good job of documenting the drugs. In, and I've in got America. another friend, Dan Adario, yeah. that wrote the book Chasing the Dragon, That's right. which is uh, his take on uh, heroin and other mm -hmm. uh, drugs that he uh, sure. was trying to find and break up cartels going back to right. the 50s. So right. it's a really wonderful book. I encourage everybody to read it. You can get it on got Amazon. got that in my nightstand right now. I'm about to crack into it. Are you? Well, yeah. good. I know you enjoy it. And if you want to meet Dan sometime, be glad to Absolutely love to. introduce you. And we're going to have to take another break in about 25 seconds. So, right. so money, 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 money. Um, more money, anything that you can do, or just any resource that you have, any time that you have that you can dedicate. If you go to realizeu252.org, you can learn more about our program, find ways to connect. Uh, but we'd love any support that you have to help us help the community with this with this situation that's uh, such a dire situation in our community. All right. We're going to take a short commercial break. We'll be right back. We're going to talk with Garrett for one more segment. All right, we're back with Garrett Biss. He is a volunteer with uh, Realize Hold you. on, I'm not getting paid for this? <laughs> you can pay for this show. I'm talking about oh, with, yeah, that's with right. your that's nonprofit. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you, you've you established the nonprofit uh, status. Yep. You found a building that you've been working on diligently. You've got an executive director. You've got a clinical director. Uh, what's next? And, and, and come back to our program. So I think we went off on a tangent. I went off on a tangent. So we're taking a holistic approach to it. So helping out first with the individual, um, helping them deal with uh, some of the sources of the trauma they've had in their past, some of the struggles and challenges that they face, understand more of the mindset of addiction or what addiction is and what it's not and how it is that maladaptive coping mechanism and then try to figure out what they're trying to cope with. Is part of the program going to be working? Absolutely. So that'll and and that's what we'll get heavy on in the later part is helping people get back to living a day to day life, finding meaning and purpose in their life. We've got uh, relationships established with the community college through the different trade schools. So whether somebody in our program wants to go back and finish their associates or get an associates or get a bachelor's degree or they got a bachelor's degree in a field that they don't love, so they want to go back and get some training in something else or get it or or there's many incredible trades programs that we have at the community college through the workforce development. So helping them find some greater meaning and purpose and, and passion in their life. Uh, so that, and that's what our, you know, that'll be the second half of the later half of the program, really focusing on that to help them, you know, just get back to the day-to-day, -day, not, not need those coping mechanisms they had, understand situations that might be taking them or fueling their temptations or fueling that, that pain inside so they can avoid that and get back to, uh, you know, living a, a successful life. So moving beyond 
a severe addiction or substance use disorder, it's not a quick process. It wasn't a quick process to get into it. It's not a quick process to get out of it. Uh, so working with people for a long period of time. Do you have, do you have a specific time frame that you work with somebody or is everybody? It's different? a multi-phase program. I, you know, the ideal, we're thinking 18 to 18 months to two years, but it's individually focused. For some people to get through a little bit faster, some people they need a little bit more time. Some people need more time in the second phase than in the first phase. Uh, but that's what we'll work closely with the individual, make sure we're providing exactly what they need to set them up as best we can for success. But it's not something that, that takes place quickly. A lot of people, they think, you know, oh, somebody's cured. They went to a detox. They went to a, a you know, a, a three-week program. And even a 90-day program, many times, isn't long enough to help somebody change so much in their life. We've got to change thought processes. We've got to help change neuropathways. We've got to help change the body's response to stress and stimuli and, and develop and foster those coping mechanisms. It can take a long, a long time. Uh, but the success rate when you go to successfully graduate through a long program, like an 18-month or two-year program, is extremely high compared to just going through a detox. If you go through a detox, okay, great, that helps you get the substance out of your body, or maybe it helps you live for three weeks without that behavior. But if you're not dealing with that source of pain, if you're not trying to find why that person has such a void, such as need or propensity to escape, then you're not really going to help them out for the long term. It's going to be, a, you know, they'll, they'll move along for a little period of time, and then they'll face another challenge, another struggle. They'll get fired from a job, have a setback. But, you know, maybe the holidays come around. A lot of people relapse during the holidays because they have to go back and, and confront whatever that, whatever that trauma or that pain or that void was. Uh, so if you don't work with somebody for a long enough period of time, then you can't really help them change that for the long period. All right, so it, did you copy a model for your program? I mean, you didn't invent the wheel, I'm assuming. When yeah, you so, Jer so our executive time. director, uh, he, he's developed a curriculum that he's um, cultivated over the last you know, 10 years or so that he's been working in, in, in this field, and he's used it and run it at a program here in eastern North Carolina for a couple of years with great success. Um, but his background and training, so not only has he uh, got a doctor in education, but he's been working, he's a licensed uh, drug addiction counselor, uh, he's a supervisor for anybody that uh, would know what that means for new counselors and therapists. He can supervise them for their for their first few years of work, and he's also and he's a pastor at a at a church out in uh, out by the beach. So he's got a lot of background, a lot of influence that kind of comes together and 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 help develop this curriculum. And then through my training, I've had a background studying with you know human potential training, self esteem training. Uh, I've got some training or some schooling in pos uh, positive psychology, applied positive psychology. Uh, it's just many different pathways or many different approaches to or tools to help empower somebody to deal with uh, you know, life as, as it is and, and really deal with it in the most constructive and positive way so they can truly live into their potential. Is this the first program of its kind in this area? Well, I mean, every program is a little bit different. It's like every restaurant you go to is a little bit different. Every program but there's no long-term. In Craven County, there's no long-term. Yeah, there's, a, there's another help. program. It's called Reviving Life Ministries, and they have both a small men's program and a women's program. I think they max out at five or six beds in, in each one. Um, and it's a similar program. It's a very... Well, see, I don't think I've ever heard of that. Sure. I don't know that I... Yeah, would have the need so, to. But and, and, and that brings a big point, and this is one of the reasons that the epidemic is so out of control because people don't talk about it. If you have a family member or a loved one or a neighbor that struggles with substance use disorder or addiction, you don't talk about it. You don't, you know, go out and seek help. If somebody went and they found a great rehab and they found a great long-term program and they come back and their life is forever transformed. You don't really go around, you know, sharing that with everybody. Really, you know, you're not posting that. True. On Facebook. I mean, if, you, if your uh, child is a sports star, then you go around bragging right. about yeah. it. But, but if, if they're struggling with something, then you right. don't go. And, and unfortunately, your next door neighbor could have the exact resources and information that you need to help you with it. They might know, you know, personally or, or very close close hand how to help you with that. But you're afraid to go talk to them about it. There's this shame. There's this guilt. There's this judgment. There's fear of judgment. There's lack of understanding. But yeah, if you're a sports star, or heck, if you, even if you go away on a great vacation, you're going to come back and you're going to tell everybody about it. If your son goes off to a great rehab and they come back, you're not going to be blasting that on Facebook and sending it out in your, your Christmas letter to let everybody know about it. So there's so many resources that are out there that people just don't know about and don't hear about because yeah, it's like, it's like the, best, it's the best kept secret that we have is trying to get that word out there. So that comes back to the second part of our mission, just helping people realize that it's something that, that affects everybody and realize some of the ways that they and can that's find a, help. And that's a good catchy name that you have there, so hopefully that name will catch on yeah. and, and uh, be touted throughout the county. Uh, all right, you go through the program, mm -hmm. year long, two years, however long it takes, uh, you complete it, that's it, you're done, you're cured, you never have to worry about it again, or do, do you 
encourage people to continue getting Absolutely. support with Absolutely. us. There's some way that you need to be plugged in. So our, our program will really kind of have a third phase to it. It's the people that have successfully graduated from our program. We're still going to cultivate that community, that involvement, have them come back, be mentors at the program for, for future residents, um, you know, do regular social events to get people back around so they can share stories. Like, hey, man, I was two years out, and then I didn't realize that this was going to be a sticky spot for me or a rough patch, and then this is the way I successfully navigated it and helped some of the the people coming behind them. So there's a huge element of service, and that's my other passion is charity and service and using that to really develop a fulfilling life. Um, so, yes, it will be just as life is. I mean, the human experience is a lifelong endeavor, that, you know, dealing with the challenges and frustrations. You know, you can't get through a heartache one time, a breakup and heartache one time, and then think that you'll never face it again or never struggle with it again. But if you have the right tools, the right resources, the right understanding going into it, it can be a much different experience. Same thing with major life challenges and trauma in your life. You know, if you've if you've relied on substances in the past to navigate the challenges and struggles and the pain that you have in your life, but you learn more effective ways of doing that without relying on those same substances and behaviors, then you can navigate it in a better way in the future. But you're always going to, there's always going to be pain in your life. There's always going to be struggle, always going to be challenges. It's really just developing those tools and the awareness to deal with it in a more effective so way. So you mentioned that volunteerism and, and trying to help other people is one of the tools that you use to keep yourself uh, Absolutely. Uh, from... I guess. That's really what my recovery has been, has been using this charity and service. And when I realized, I really recognized that, and we've talked about this before, I wrote a book called Charity, the Gifts of Giving, and I talk about all the benefits that we receive when we do something kind or generous for another person. Everything that a human being wants in their life is, is I think, categorized either emotionally, physically, or spiritually. The, when, anything that we do, we're trying to seek some kind of gain in one of those three areas. Well, you can, seek, you can receive gain in those three areas by serving other people emotionally. It makes you feel better. You get a release of endorphins, of dopamine, of oxytocin that calms your nerves, make you feel emotionally better. Everybody's gone out and served somebody or done something to help out, and you feel good inside, whether it's opening the door for somebody that's walking with a box to the door or whether you spend a weekend. You know, Many people in our, our community learn this through Florence. Some, for many people, it's the first time they got out and helped other people, helped their neighbor who was uh, in a challenge. But you emotionally benefit, you physiologically benefit. Those same endorphins that are released in your body that make you feel better actually make your body perform better, improves immune function. So that helps explain last yeah. Saturday I was riding down to Minnesota mm -hmm. and it was about 90, it might have been Friday, I can't remember. It was about 95 degrees out in the middle of the day and I look over on my right in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and there's a Samaritan's Purse van with people out putting on a roof for somebody. Really? Wow. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, yeah. why, why would a volunteer come mm -hmm. from uh, Kansas City or somewhere to Newburgh, North Carolina right. to go out and work in 95 degree right. heat. And it's because that's it. Absolutely. So the it same thing, yeah, spiritually, good. emotionally, and physically, the same thing that we do. You know, if we go drink a beer, if we go spend some money, if we go watch a movie, if we go just hang out with friends, those same endorphins you look at a neurological level, the same endorphins, the same physiological response that our body's having, you get that when you serve somebody else. But for them, doing a unique experience like that of service. They'll, get, they'll continue to feel those positive emotions forever, those positive benefits forever. When they think back on, hey, remember that time we went down to New Bern and we were Craven County and we were helping out down there? That'll, that, just recalling that memory will give that flood of positive emotions and positive endorphins, which that can be a great way to fill the void. And that's what I found is through service and through charity and finding ways to get involved is a great way to fill that void, provide that meaning and purpose in my life. But also it develops that emotional resilience to those negative emotions. So now when I face a challenge or a struggle, it doesn't cut as deeply as it did before. It doesn't dig that void as deeply as it did before. The United States has had a war on drugs for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. It's obviously been a failure. Um, any suggestions on that? Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that chasing this, the scream, and this is a controversial topic, we can spend a whole hour talking about this, but whether legalization would be a, a way to move forward. And I would like to talk about that because I'm sure you've done some research on it. There's a little bit of, um, you know, established evidence out there, but we're going to have to take a short break before we do. So we'll talk about that when we come back. In the meantime, uh, you've got 10 seconds. If you'd like to speak to something, if you can get it in and all right, realizeyou.org. If you know somebody who's struggling or know somebody who's challenged, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on our website. Please give us a call, reach out. Uh, if we're not the right program for you, we'd like to direct you in the, in the direction of where you can go.
All right, we're back, and this is the final segment, I do believe. We're with Garrett Biss. He's been telling us about this new program, which I'm yeah. extremely excited about, and I applaud you and all the others that have uh, diligently worked for two years almost to put this together. Yeah. It should be opening soon. Uh, there's always a need for money. It costs right. money. You have to have an executive director and a clinical director, and uh, you have to pay the we got some more capital light costs bills. and more things that we need to just get this house up and running. Uh, we will There will be a low cost for patients to come through our program, a fraction of what many programs are like. How uh, will the patients pay? I mean, <clears throat> so it's self-pay. Usually patients, I mean, for many of them, they'll be getting help from family members, from loved ones. Some will have the resources to pay for it, but we're looking at eight, uh, $850 a month for an individual, um, but for that, I mean, you get round-the-clock care, you're getting counseling, therapy, everything's inclusive. Uh, and I could I could see people getting sponsors if their families Certainly. could and support it, maybe a church. That's right, and that's, that'll be the next thing that we look forward to is sponsorship so we can provide scholarships to some people. You know, there'll be a normal application if you're accepted in the program, then you can apply for uh, some financial assistance, and if we have it, then we'll certainly make it available. But, there, yeah, there are programs to minimize that cost. We find it, you know, it's very important, though. We want to minimize the cost and make it accessible to everybody. But we also need to have, we feel it's important to have some cost associated with it, no matter how small it is, just so that everybody has some skin in the game, so that there's a vested, you know, a vested piece in, in We the mentioned uh, before the last commercial break about uh, the war on drugs, mm -hmm. and it's been a failure for whatever yeah. reasons. Um, our and jails are full of yeah. drug addicts, of drug dealers. Good things that have come out of it, and many bad things that have come out of it. And we saw the same thing with prohibition. You know, for for the good effects that came from it, the negative out effects severely outweighed it. And really, uh, alcohol in America took off when they when they made it illegal because of the people that were getting getting involved in it. Now, the money that could be made by you know Ill, uh, illegal distribution and manufacturing of it soared. So now there's a lot more motive to do it. Uh, with the price of, you know, with drugs that are illegal, there's just so much uh, profit to be made that there's a huge incentive not only for uh, people in our own country to get involved in the manufacturing and distribution of it, but other countries. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Are there any gateway, uh, gateway drugs really for opiates, or do you just start with? I mean, <coughs> marijuana is not a gateway drug. Well, right? you know, and there's arguments to be made that it is and it isn't. I say that it is because I look at addiction as a behavioral thing. And this is why I say it's a gateway drug. Maybe not because of the chemical hooks in it, but say you're a 16 year old child, you've heard all your life that marijuana is terrible and it's gonna kill you and destroy your whole life uh, and stay away from it. And then you experiment and you try it once and you see that it doesn't, it doesn't destroy your life the first time. It's also, it's something that's illegal. So you know that you're breaking the law and you're not getting caught. So it's planting these seeds and it's demonstrating to you a behavior that you can do something that's illegal that everybody says is terrible and is gonna destroy your life and you don't see consequences right away. In that aspect, I say it's very much a gateway drug because you're planting that seed that, you know, even more so I think than alcohol because alcohol is legal. It is socially acceptable, uh, much more than marijuana in, in many places, but, um, but somebody that experiments with that, they're also not, you know, breaking, well, they're breaking an underage drinking law, but they're not obtaining and, and holding a, you know, a substance that's illegal. So I say it's a gateway drug because it's planting that seed that you can get away with this and you're not going to get caught and your life's not going to end. So it plants that seed that, well, everything else I must have heard about, it must be BS. Nobody knows what they're talking about. They're just trying to hold me down or they're just trying to keep me from doing something that I enjoy. So in that, it plants that seed for that behavior that it is something that you can get away with. And now, so, no, you know, going from never touching a drug to putting a, a heroin needle in your arm or taking a pill that somebody hands you that you're not really sure what it is, that's an enormous leap. But if you go from never touching a drug to taking a sip of beer and nothing bad happens to your friend gives you a joint and nothing bad happens, now you're a lot closer to doing something that's more extreme. You're kind of walking that, walking that line. So I say it's a gateway drug for that, not, maybe not because of uh, chemical hooks in the brain or anything, but behaviorally I say that it certainly is. They've legalized marijuana in Colorado. Have you studied the effects yeah, of so that, negative and positive? Or? Yeah, so there's two different approaches. So uh, Washington and Colorado um, both have, they've taken two, two different approaches. One is legalization. Colorado's gone legalization route. The other is decriminalization. So it's really two different approaches to, you know, to a similar end in, in mind. Legalization, the benefits of it is you tax it, you regulate it, um, and you can use that money to fund other things in the state uh, and, and fund the policing of other things that are still illegal. Decriminalization just means that you're not you know, you're not going to face the, the fines or the penalties. It's much more like a speeding ticket than, you know, than 
a, a possible jail sentence or huge fines. Um, and there was a district attorney that was interviewed in this book called Chasing the Scream that said, you know, she wasn't for it. She's very opposed to any kind of drugs. So she, was, she wasn't for the decriminalization. But when she looked at her, the amount of work that she does and the number of drug cases that she sees, she said there were other things like, th you know, thefts and domestic violence issues that were put before that she never got to see that she had to dismiss or, or let go because she was spending all of her time focusing on these drug-related offenses. And when you have a drug-related offense for somebody who's young, for somebody who's pre-adulthood uh, pre in their adolescence, or somebody who's 20 years old just trying to find their way in life, you get this permit, you know, you get this scarlet letter, you get this, this mark against you that's going to affect the rest of your life. You know, somebody who's really just finding who they are, our brains are still developing until we're 25 or 26 years old. We're still trying to find out who we are and what we want to do in life. You get this one drug charge when you're 20, 22, and now that permanently caps the, you know, the potential that you have and limits so many of your possibilities in the future. So she, she didn't think that was right. So she was a huge advocate for decriminalization. She doesn't want to make it legal. She doesn't want to make it at more available. But decriminalization of it has many positive effects. And then Colorado went the other route, and they legalized uh, the marijuana so that they could tax it and they could regulate it. And they've had, you know, they, everybody thought that marijuana use was going to skyrocket and go, yeah, but, it, but it doesn't. It didn't. You know, it, it didn't skyrocket. I mean, there's a lot more people using it casually now, but they're not all just becoming addicts and sitting around their house smoking weed all the time. Just like not everybody in the world sits around and drinks alcohol from the time they wake up till they go to bed. And it's, it's available. It's accessible some everywhere. Do, but some, some are do, doing yeah, that right. regardless. Some people, yeah, and there's some people that, are, that do smoke marijuana like that all the time. But just by making it available, and that's come back to my, my position on it, it's a behavioral thing. Just We've got to look at the pain. We've got to look at the reason that somebody's trying to escape. De um, Making it illegal doesn't solve that problem. Making something illegal doesn't solve somebody's you know, desire to use it, desire to escape that pain or that void inside. They're going to find some other way to do it. We can make anything illegal to find other ways. I mean, look at hom homeless people or, uh, that are destitute people that, have, that are alcoholics. I mean, they, don't have, they can't get alcohol, but they can get hand sanitizer. They can get mouthwash. They can get other things. They'll find some other way to avoid or escape that pain. So if we don't look at the human, if we don't look at coming from a compassionate place and look at why they're struggling, why they have the issues that they do, why they really need the help, and we only shame them and judge them and try to hold them down even more, it's only going to exacerbate the problem make it worse. That's why it's spiraling out of control. That's why it's getting so much worse. All right. Well, we're about to run out of time. Right. Uh, Garrett, uh, you mentioned the fun, me fundraiser coming anything up. Anything I can do. Yeah, so we just did a fundraiser on Friday. We're still, we got a capital campaign right now. We still need to raise $27,000 before we can open the door. If you can make any contribution, it would be huge help. And please reach out to me. I'll post my uh, contact information on this Facebook page. and, and uh, all right, realize and you guys can share it. website again one That's more right. time. Realizeyou252.org, and you can find us on Facebook as well. All right, folks, that's all we have for today. We'll see you next week. <laughs>